right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all very much for coming along. Um, as Annie said, I'm going to talk to you today about disease risk with respect to our ecological restoration. So unfortunately, many of us, I think, are becoming increasingly used to seeing unhealthy looking trees. We're all aware of ash trees dying due to ash dieback. There's a huge hope decline. June, the Phytophthora, Larch has got Remorum, Phytophthora Remorum, and the list could go on and on. And uh, I sometimes worry I'm, I'm known as Dr. Doom whenever I talk because I'm always talking about the risk of um, trees being impacted by disease. But I've become increasingly concerned that perhaps we always think about uh, plant health in relation to trees. What we don't often stop and think about is perhaps plant health in relation to non-tree plants. So, for example, what might happen if a pest or pathogen established that impacted our heather, Luna vulgaris? Certainly in Scotland, um, heather covers a wide um, area and you know, it could have huge impacts. Well, what might happen if we started to lose some species out of some of our species-rich grasslands? And really, the impacts of plant health are perhaps far wider than we often think about. And this is really why I started to get interested in this um, subject. You might be aware that in Scotland, we've got a plant health centre of expertise that's funded by the Scottish Government. Um, and that's really to translate scientific research into policy advice. And I'm on the science and advisory response team for that centre. And last year, I completed a, a project or fellowship with the Plant Health Centre and working with Nature Scott, very much looking at the risks of that plant health poses to the natural environment. So when I'm talking about plant health, I just want to be clear for the purposes of today what it is I mean in terms of plant health. So. When I'm talking about plant health, I'm talking about the consequences of biotic agents, so pests and pathogens. Um, you can see a list of what that might include there. Uh, so collectively through today's webinar, I'll probably just refer to them as pests, but that doesn't just mean I'm talking about insects or, or, or um, pests, it means I'm talking about bacteria, fungi, et cetera, any of those sort of biotic agents. What I'm not referring to today is the impacts of poor management on plant health or the impacts of invertebrate herbivores such as squirrels and deer, the impacts of maybe poor soils or the direct impacts of climate change. Although obviously we know that climate change will have an impact on the severity of pests and pathogens and on their distribution. So we do need to think about that in terms of um, how climate change might impact plant health in terms of pest distribution. So just to uh, start today's uh, webinar, I thought we'd start with a poll. and um, We'd ask you whether plant, you think plant pests and pathogens are a major driver of biodiversity loss. And by that, I mean both the impact directly onto the, the host plants, but also the cascading effects that this could have if host plants were lost on the biodiversity that they're associated with. So hopefully Annie's got a poll that she can bring up. Sorry, Ruth, we're having a few issues. It says that I'm logged in from another device. So I'm just getting ah. someone else to log out. Um, Don't worry. And we'll hopefully launch a poll. If we can get it sorted, I will let you know. Don't worry, shall I carry on for the moment? Or yeah, you, you carry on one? for the moment I'll and I'll let you know one. if we, we can, rectify we it. it. Yeah, we can do it at the end of the section or something. So I'm going to have three sections to this talk. So the first section is looking at the risks that pests and pathogens pose to our habitats. The second section is thinking about how stakeholders' actions or inactions might um, enhance or mitigate those risks, and then thinking about what we can actually do to reduce those risks. So firstly, thinking about the risks that pests and pathogens pose. So I don't know if you're aware, but there is something called the um, UK Plant Health Risk Register. So this is available on the DEFRA website. Uh, you can download it as an Excel spreadsheet or you can just use it online. And the risk register lists all the pests that DEFRA are concerned about 
that could establish in the UK. So it largely lists non-native pests that are not currently present in the UK, but it also includes some pests and pathogens that are present in the UK, but are not like widespread yet. And that risk register will tell you what all the um, host plants are that those pests will um, use. And you can see a, a small clip of that um, risk register there. So what I've done is I downloaded that risk register and I linked it through to the National Vegetation Database. Now you're probably all much more familiar with the National Vegetation Classification than you are with the risk register, I'm guessing. But just in case, so the uh, National Vegetation Classification uh, classifies communities of our vegetation in Britain. Um, so it groups um, communities of plants together and gives them names. And by joining those two databases together, I was able to create a database of all the pests that could be hosted by different plant species in different habitats in the UK. So what did that give me? Uh, that showed me that the risk register lists 916 pests that could be hosted by plant genera that occur in our semi-natural habitats in the UK at over 25% cover. So I had to do it at the plant genera level. This is because the risk register um, is very dominated or biased towards commercial plants. So it often doesn't list the species of plants that we see in our native habitats as hosts. It will list the equivalent host in a sort of forestry or agricultural context. So I had to make the assumption that those pests would also occur on genera that are found in our natural habitats. And I did focus on plant species that are found at more than 25% cover. Um, because I thought that that's where we, we'd see a really big impact if we lost plant species that are quite dominant. But 916 pests is still quite a lot. Um, I think the Plant Health Centre was hoping I'd come up with a nice short list of pests and pathogens that they could focus on. And 916 was um, far too many. So then I tried to refine this list by what we called the mitigated likelihood. Uh, that's a lot of terminology. Um, what I mean by that is in the risk register, um, they, there's a likelihood score. So that's the likelihood of a pest or pathogen establishing in the UK. So if it's one, it's seen as a low score. If it's five, it's seen as a high score. If the pest is not currently present in the UK, it's um, a score composed of the likelihood of that pest entering into the UK and establishing if the pest is already present in the UK, it's a score based on how likely the pest is to spread to its maximum extent in the next five years. But essentially, all you need to know is four and five are high, below that is lower, lower risk or low likelihood of the pest establishing. And by mitigation, what I mean is that in the risk register, DEFRA have given two scores. So there's the likelihood of the pest establishing in the UK, and then they say, well, if we implement all the mitigation we can to reduce the likelihood of those pests establishing, such as um, import prohibitions on key hosts, we can then reduce the likelihood of those pests establishing. So I've taken the mitigated likelihood in the data that I'm about to show you. And if we do that, we can reduce our list down to 91 pests. So that's still really quite a lot of pests and pathogens, with quite a high likelihood of establishing, assuming that all the mitigation that DEFRA wants to um, implement is in place and works, um, that could be hosted by plants in our natural habitats. And this is where those pests could be hosted. So this graph shows the um, sort of broad habitats that are listed in the NVC and the number of pests that could be hosted by plants in those different habitats, split down by the likelihood as to whether they're four or five, so the sort of the two highest categories. And you can see that woodland and open habitats and shingle and swamps are quite high, whereas habitats such as cal calfugus grasslands and aquatic habitats are much lower. You can also drill down into that data and come up with um, numbers of pests that are far um, 
at a community level. So as you probably know, for example, within the Heathland community, Heathland um, Broad Habitat in the NVC, that's broken down into different communities. And those communities are just numbered up the side because the names are too long to, to put on the graph. But the numbers represent different communities and different communities within the broad habitat of Heathland have different risks of being um, of hosting different plant of hosting different pests because of their plant community composition. So you can see there that H H seven and H nineteen are the two Heathland communities that could actually host a lot of the pests and pathogens. But it's really not just the likelihood of pests and pathogens establishing that we need to think about. We also need to think about the cascading impacts of those pests and pathogens onto other species. So if a pest or a pathogen establishes and influences a host plant and that host plant declines in abundance, that could also influence all the other species that use that host plant. So as Annie mentioned in her introduction, I started my interest in plant health, looking at trees and tree associated biodiversity. And in terms of our ash trees in the UK, they host 955 species and our oak trees over 2000. And of those 45 of those ash associated species are obligate. So they only occur on ash trees. So you lose our ash and we're gonna lose potentially 45 other species. See so a decline in our oak trees and we could see a decline in over 300 species. But it's more than just that we need to think about, because that's thinking about one species declining in isolation. It's not thinking about the cumulative impact. If we, for example, had the unfortunate situation of losing oak and ash, we'd actually have over 500 species at risk, because there's 141 species that only use ash and oak. So when thinking about these risks, we really need to think beyond just the risks to the individual um, host plant, but think about that whole wider biodiversity and the ecosystem functioning effects. So just kind of out of interest, I had a quick brainstorm the other day as to what might happen if heather declined. So, you know, there's far more impacts than the ones I've listed here, but just off the top of my head, some ideas. Um, heather's nest and tall heather could maybe struggle to find suitable breeding habitat. Red grouse, capercaillie, black grouse, merlin, all dependent on heather habitats to some extent. Lesser tway blade. Would we see our heather moorlands becoming more grass dominated and reverting to grass moors instead of heather dominated moors? And then you could start thinking about the functions and services that could decline. Um, if heather started to die back due to a pest or pathogen, would that create a lot of bare ground? Would we see soil erosion, carbon loss? That would then lead to a decline in water quality. And then of course, certainly in Scotland, our heather moorlands have got a lot of cultural value, economic value, and that visual attraction that Scotland's known for is heather moorlands. So that's just setting it in that broader context to starting to think about the wider implications of plant health. So what I've hopefully shown you in this sort of first section of the talk is that I think there is good evidence that there are considerable risks um, to plant health in all semi-natural habitats. Um, I think often we're very focused on trees and that's where the focus has been. Um, all the focus is on agriculture and horticultural systems. And what I'm really trying to do is just raise awareness that there could be these risks in other habitats too. And although the likelihood might be quite low, I would argue that the ecological impact, as I've tried to show you, could be quite high. And the sort of scenario I say here is that um, hopefully the likelihood of my house burning down is quite low, but I still insure my house. And I think we should have the same sort of attitude when we're thinking about plant health in all our different natural habitats. So that takes me to the end of my first section, and I'm going to see if Annie's resolved her technical issues. Yeah, the we could actually polls... start with the first poll if you have. Yeah, so the polls, polls are, are working. Right, available. Right. So we'll go back to right, poll we'll... one. We'll go back to poll one for fun. 
I don't know if you'll, you you might have scored it differently now I've told you that but anyway <laughs> so Pip Carry if on. you could launch poll one please so poll one are plant pests and pathogens a major driver of biodiversity loss and you can either strongly agree agree neutral disagree or strongly disagree so I don't know how we're doing I think Annie can see when most people have submitted And once most people have submitted, then hopefully she can share the results. I mean, something I find interesting is we do a lot of talk about inns and um, invasive non-native species. But usually when we're talking about inns, we think about big species. We don't think about pests and pathogens. So people have started calling sort of pests and pathogens and non-native pests and pathogens micro inns, um, just to try and really get them on the inns radar, because there's a lot of work going on about inns. Um, invasive non-native species, but uh, we don't often think about that in terms of pests and pathogens. So here we go. So over 50% of you agree with that and nearly 40% of you strongly disagree, strongly agree, sorry. So that's good. Um, I'm glad we haven't got any uh, strongly disagrees or disagrees around here because uh, that would have, well, might have led to an interesting discussion afterwards. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. And our second poll, is moving towards the second section of this talk, which is thinking about um, stakeholders' perceptions of risks when they're managing land. So when you're carrying out land management operations, do you or your organization assess the biosecurity risks? So by that, I mean, do you actually stop and think where and how could plant pests and pathogens establish when maybe you're carrying out habitat restoration or other land management operations? So hopefully we should have our second poll. There we are. So do you always, sometimes, never, or don't know? Carry out a risk assessment. And once people have filled it in, and it looks like most of the answers are in, we can see the results. I've got the results from other polls that I've done this with, so we'll see how you differ. <laughs> ah, well, it's over 50% sometimes carry out a risk assessment. So 6% of you never do, and 8% of you don't know. And... Uh, 29% of you always carry out a risk assessment. Well, round of applause for the 29% of you. That's really good. Um, delighted to hear that. And hopefully perhaps the next uh, part of this talk will encourage some of you to move from the sometimes to the always section. But the third poll then moves on to looking, oops, my slides will go forward. So once you've carried out a risk assessment, you really then need to think about what biosecurity protocols you're going to put in place to reduce those risks. And I wondered whether you carried out or whether you had biosecurity protocol to ask about that. Oh, yeah. So do you always sometimes never or never carry out have um, biosecurity protocols to reduce the biosecurity risks? And if you don't know, there's a don't know option. So again, once people have filled it in, we can see what the results are. Sometimes, there we are. So it's about near 58% uh, sometimes have protocols. Nearly 30% always have a protocol, 10% if you don't know, and 2% never. So hopefully perhaps some of the uh, information I'm about to share with you might help you think about how you could um, start to have some better biosecurity protocols. And then my final poll, 
it's thinking about who's responsible for biosecurity within your organization. So is there anyone responsible for biosecurity within your organization? And there's a yes, no, or don't know option. Because I think this is perhaps sometimes the issue with biosecurity is that it might fall down between different roles within an organization. But it'll be interesting to see what you all think. So again, once they've all come through, we can see the results. Oh, that one's much more even. So yeah, about a third in each category. So about a third of you have got somebody responsible for biosecurity, a third of you haven't, and about a third of you don't know. So yeah, very interesting. Okay, well, thank you very much. That maybe puts, um, hopefully we can put those results from that poll into some context of the wider work that I've been doing over the next couple of sections in this talk. So yeah, the second section is thinking about the risks in terms of stakeholders, or by stakeholders, I mean practitioners out on the ground doing the work. So when I did this work with uh, the Plant Health Centre and with Nature Scott, I carried out a survey. So I specifically sent this questionnaire to people that were working on habitat restoration and creation. And the aim was to try and understand how aware people were of the risks that plant health posed when they were doing habitat restoration and creation. I specifically focused on habitat restoration and creation because I thought that was an activity that occurred in the sort of conservation arena where there was a high risk of pests and pathogens establishing. And this survey actually got sent out around CIEM. So if any of you who are listening to this filled in that survey, I would really like to say how grateful I am for you filling it in. Um, when I said I wanted to do a survey, um, some of the people at the Plant Health Centre were a bit concerned that I wouldn't get enough responses. They'd done previous surveys and they thought, ah, oh, Ruth will be lucky if she gets about 20 responses. And I got 224 responses. So I'm really grateful for any of you that filled in that questionnaire. And what I'm going to show you now is some of the responses um, from that questionnaire. And many of the questions in that, in that questionnaire actually mirrored or were very similar to the questions we've just been doing in our polls. So one of the first things I said to the participants was how likely do you think plant pests and pathogens are to establish in the range of habitats? And this was the list of habitats. And then how likely do you think the plant pests and pathogens are to cause a decline in each of those habitats? And they could rank them from a high risk to a low risk and then they had a don't know option. So when we asked participants about the likelihood of pests and pathogens establishing, they thought that the greatest risk was in woodlands, and that was ranked far higher than all other habitats except fresh water. And alpine and montane habitats were actually ranked far lower than all other habitats. And how participants scored the risk wasn't actually influenced by which habitats they worked on. When they thought about which habitats might be most impacted um, because of a change in biodiversity due to pests and pathogens, the ranking was actually very similar. So again, they ranked woodlands higher than all other habitats and alpine and montane habitats lower than all the other habitats. And again, the score wasn't influenced by which habitats people were. So I found this quite interesting. Um, those habitats that have had a lot of publicity recently were actually ranked highest. So that's really good in as much as we've had a lot of publicity about the impacts of pests and pathogens in woodlands recently um, and trees dying back. So it's perhaps not surprising that woodlands were ranked high. There's also been quite a bit of publicity around fresh water about fishing equipment and things being clean when you arrive. So I wonder if those habitats are ranked at the top because of that publicity in which in many ways is really good because it shows that that publicity is working. Um, 
Perhaps what's intriguing though is actually some of the results I've shown you earlier is that there are other pests and pathogens that could establish in these other habitats as well. So I think we need to think about that. And just because a pest or uh, a habitat might have a lot of pests and pathogens potentially establishing in it doesn't necessarily mean that it won't have a big impact. So, sorry, I'll explain that again. So, for example, um, moors and heathlands didn't have as many pests and pathogens um, that could establish in them on the risk register as woodlands, for example. But the impact on biodiversity could be as great as in woodlands or greater particularly, for example, if something did start to cause a decline in heather or vaccinium, or if in a reed bed, for example, if you've got a pest or pathogen that started impacting some of the reed species. So I think we need to be a bit careful about separating out the likelihood of a pest or pathogen establishing versus the wider impact on the biodiversity. We also asked the participants whether they had a risk assessment. Um, and about half the respondents either didn't know or didn't have one. So I should have written down the results from the polls, but I think that's a fairly sort of similar, perhaps you think you were perhaps a bit better than the, the respondents here, but a sort of similar level of um, responses there. We asked about whether they had biosecurity best practice. And about 70% of people did have uh, best practice guidance. So. Um, that was really good. But what concerned me was that if people didn't have a risk assessment, but they did have best practice guidance, how did they know that that best practice was actually mitigating the risk? Because um, really those two need to go hand in hand. You need to have a risk assessment, identify the risks, and then work out how you're gonna mitigate those risks by having your best practice guidance um, and biosecurity practice. We also check, asked them whether they checked if that guidance was followed. Um, and 22% of the respondents didn't actually check whether the guidance was followed. So it's all well and good having guidance, but you do need to make sure people follow it. And then we asked them whether anybody in their organization had responsibility for biosecurity. And uh, yeah, this is the same question as I asked you. And again, about similar similar responses here, actually, because 60% either didn't have or didn't know if anyone was responsible for biosecurity in the survey. And just now we had, yeah, about 30% didn't know and 30% didn't have anyone. So that response was fairly consistent there. We also talked about where participants thought the likelihood was of pests and pathogens establishing from. Um, so we gave them a range of uh, ways that pests and pathogens could establish, and we asked them to rank them. So they ranked them from high to low risk, and this was the overall ranking. So the participants in this survey thought the spread from neighboring sites and movement of machinery was high risk, and then the sort of introduction of mature plants and the introduction of seed was uh, much lower risk. I found this quite interesting because I wondered how the results would influence people's behavior. If you think that the greatest risk of the pest or pathogen is from my neighbor's site, is there a risk that you're not gonna be bothered to do anything at your own site to reduce the risk because you think the risk is gonna come from your neighboring neighbors? And similarly, the question of the introduction of mature plants was ranked at a very similar level of risk to the introduction of seed. And if you actually look at the literature, um, that would show that the introduction of mature plants is a far higher risk than the introduction of seed. We then talked about whether um, people monitored plant health, the complete habitat restoration and creation. So when you went back and looked at the success of that restoration, did you um, look for plant health? Did you see how healthy the plants were? And we gave them different options. You can see around a third of people did carry out some monitoring for various lengths of time. About a third of people didn't carry out any monitoring. And about a third of people ticked the other box. And that other box is then expanded. And some people thought that um, plant health monitoring would be picked up by general habitat monitoring. 
other people felt it wasn't their responsibility or they didn't know and then some people did think that plant health was monitored after the completion of restoration but didn't know for how long. So some key messages from the survey. In terms of perceptions, I think it's interesting that people perceive that their neighbours are the most likely to have be a source of infection, not their own activity. There is this issue about whether people think are assessing the risks accurately with mature plants and seeds being assessed as the same level of risk. In terms of knowledge, um, People seem to be assessing the risks to habitat, perhaps based on publicity and what they know about most. And they don't seem to be distinguishing between the risks to a habitat and then the sort of wider biodiversity risks necessarily. In terms of procedures, um, it was good that so many people had biosecurity protocols, um, but there did seem to be a lack of risk assessments. People weren't necessarily checking if that guidance was followed. Um, and there didn't seem to be people responsible for biosecurity in their organisations. And then finally, there seemed to be a lack of monitoring in some cases about after the habitats were created or restored, whether plant health was monitored. So that's the end of the second section of my talk. The third section really moves on to, well, what can we do about it? If these risks are out there, and some of our activities that we do as practitioners out on the land could um, risk uh, moving those pests and pathogens around, what can we do to reduce them? And the real answer is actually in the new CIM guidance. There's the Good Practice Guidance for Ecological Restoration that came out in January this year. And the third principle of your 10 principles is to avoid adverse impacts. So effective ecological restoration projects must avoid adverse effects to habitat species populations of high conservation value. And it says that you should uh, try and reduce those risks. And that's really what I'm talking about here. So if ever these guidance are expanded uh, or if people are looking for ways to think about avoiding adverse risk, I would strongly argue that thinking about pests and pathogens is one part of thinking about avoiding adverse risk. What we've produced as part of uh, the work I did was a biosecurity best practice for conservation. And this can be downloaded there. Um, it's the web links available there. I think Annie's gonna put it in the chat for you and I'll put it at the end of the talk as well. But we've come up with five principles to promote plant health during when we're carrying out best practice for conservation. And I'm going to run through these five principles briefly now. So the first one is risk assessments. When we did the survey, people seemed to be struggling to know what to put in a risk assessment. And uh, I didn't show you the results, but I asked the participants what other things they'd like uh, more help and guidance on. And producing risk assessments was one of those things. Now, usually when you do a risk assessment, you sort of score it as to the um, likelihood of the event occurring, of the risk occurring, and you have a score for the impact, and you multiply those two scores together and you get a sort of overall value. I don't really think we're that far ahead in our thinking yet. We can't really put numbers onto our risk assessments. But I think we can rank the risks, and I think this is a good start to start thinking about whether things are at the lower end of that risk spectrum or the higher end which is why we've got this lower to higher across the top here. Um, so we're not saying, for example, that introducing seed is no risk. There is some risk, but there are very few pests and pathogens that are transported on seed. Far more are transported on adult plants. So if you're thinking about how to introduce a new plant to a, a restoration site, and it's possible to do seed rather than an adult plant, then the lower risk would be to introduce the seed. And you can think about that in a range of these different risk factors that we've got around down here. So are you moving soil? If not, then that reduces the risks. But if you are, that's a much higher risk because of all the pests and pathogens that could be in the soil as well. You really need to think about the interactions with the nurseries or wherever you might be growing plants on. I know a lot of restoration projects or um, translocation projects involve moving plants around and breeding them on. 
um, but we need to think about the distance and how far you're moving plants from where they're sourced to the nursery and then from the nursery to the root site. And we also need to think about the numbers of plants. If we're only moving a few individuals, that's a much lower risk than if we're moving thousands and thousands of plants for a big restoration project. Again, we need to think about the propagation facilities and how clean they are, whether they've got good biosecurity uh, protocols. And then whether the species that you're breeding, um, going to propagate and uh, transplant is actually susceptible to a wide range of pests and pathogens. Because if it is, then there's a high risk that the, 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 the plant you're wanting to translocate or move in your restoration project um, might, might die, might succumb to a pest or pathogen. We also need to think about whether your plant that you're breeding will support a wide range of pests and pathogens that can also impact a lot of other plant species. And if it does, again, we need to think through the selection of the species that you're um, propagating and breeding for the restoration projects, because that could have much higher risks. The risk assessments also need to think about things like equipment and moving that equipment and the location of the site. So if your restoration site is quite close to a road or a track, that will probably also reduce the risk because it means you're not moving that machinery across large areas of um, land. You're not maybe crossing land ownership boundaries um, and transporting potentially and spreading the risks across a far wider area. You also need to think about where your contractors might come from. How local are they? If you're bringing contractors in from the other end of the country, um, what are the risks that they're also bringing pests and pathogens with them? Have they cleaned their equipment and things? And then once you finish your restoration, there's the ongoing management that might occur at that site. So you'll still need to keep some sort of risk assessment for that in terms of um, contractors or yourselves entering the site, things like hand tools being brought onto the site and whether they're clean and how you might provide any biosecurity necessary for recreational visitors. The second of my five best, uh, best practice uh, suggestions is biosecurity protocols. So by this, I mean that we need to develop um, actions to mitigate or reduce the risks that we identified in the risk assessments. So hopefully what you'll have seen as I've been going through the last few slides is this third column, risk reduction measures. And this we really hope to help people um, think about how they can reduce those risks. So obviously I'm not gonna go back through all those slides and point them all out, but each of those slides I've just gone through has got this risk reduction column. And this is really the sorts of things that we'd hope that people would put in their um, biosecurity protocols that they'd use to try and reduce some of those risks. And I'd really like to make it clear that I'm not trying to stop people doing some really wonderful habitat restoration and creation. We really need a lot of that restoration and creation that's going on, a lot of the conservation work. I really don't want biosecurity to start stopping that restoration work. Um, but what we are trying to say is that there are perhaps some quite small things that people can do to try and reduce the risks. So for example, Nature Scott, I've got a fantastic um, program at the moment to uh, move twin flower around and, and um, propagate twin flower. And um, they've now signed up to this. They've, they've taken on board our best practice recommendations and they're incorporating it in their twin flower um, project. So the third or the second one, well, another part of that biosecurity protocol that I'm talking about is the nursery production of plants. Often when we're res restoring habitats, we want to um, gate plants and transplant them. And I think this is perhaps something we don't think about very much. Often conservation um, translocations occur in quite small areas. People often encourage um, locals or citizen scientists to perhaps grow on some of the plants to get locals involved, which is great. But we do need to think about the biosecurity and the phytosanitary um, properties of the nurseries or the areas where these plants are being grown before we go planting them out. And you can see some of the key things we need to think about there in terms of 
whether the pots are clean, whether the growing media is clean, um, whether there's puddles of water and irrigation lying around the site and how that can create um, areas for um, pests and pathogens to breed. And then do things like what happens to dead plants and the waste plant waste management. And again, that's all documented in this leaflet if you want to look into it further. And these risks are really very real. There's some examples in North America where there's been a widespread um, phytophthora being spread out from nurseries that have been breeding plants for habitat restoration and creation that have then spread out into the wider environment because they've come out of these nurseries. The third thing that we can all do is have somebody involved in our organisation that's got responsibility for biosecurity. Um, I don't really think we need to go into that anymore other than just to really recommend that. So there's one point of contact. The fourth thing we can do is to make sure that we have regular checks on those protocols that people are actually following them. And again, that's very self-explanatory. There's no point having these things if we don't follow the guidance. And then the final thing is in relation to monitoring. So we all just need to be aware of plant health and actually include plant health as part of the regular monitoring that goes on. So at an individual level or as an organisational level, you can certainly do that in the work that you're doing. When you're assessing the success of your habitat restoration, you can see how the plants are performing and whether there's any pests or pathogens establishing. The second thing, just to make you aware of more, is thinking about plant health monitoring more nationwide. As I got to the end of this work, I started to think about, well, what do you do if you find a plant pest or pathogen? And I suddenly realized that I hadn't got a clue. If I found a new plant pest or pathogen somewhere, or I was worried, I wouldn't know what to do. So I contacted um, Nature Scott and I contacted the plant health officers in Scotland. And this actually led to quite a discussion about what do you do if you find a potential new um, plant pest or pathogen in the natural environment? And in summary, what our discussions led to is that we seem to have procedures in place once a quarantine pest is identified. So if I can tell, if I, I can tell the chief plant officer that there's a quarantine pest on a certain location, they've got the powers to go and try and um, isolate that pest to try and limit access to the area and to try and potentially remove that pest. What we're currently lacking is actually any monitoring of plant health in our natural environment, our natural habitats. And it's not really clear who we report possibly unhealthy plant pests, uh, unhealthy plants to or new pests to. It seems to fall down between the gaps. So in Scotland, the health of our habitats um, or the condition of our habitats is the responsibility of Nature Scott. Same in England, it's natural England. But they're not really thinking about plant pests and pathogens when they're thinking about that health of the habitat. Um, plant pests and pathogens tends to fall under forestry or under agriculture. And those different groups of people aren't really joined up. It is clear what to do if you find a pest on a tree, so that we've got tree alert but we don't have the equivalent for non-tree plants. So this is very much um, part of ongoing discussions with um, Scotland's Chief Plant Health Officer and with DEFRA. Um, I can't really say any more than that. It's really just to sort of flag it that it's very much a topic for conversation at the moment as we think through how do we have a wider awareness and monitoring of plant health in our natural environment and who is responsible. So in summary, I just really like to say that I think the risks that plant health pose to our natural environment are real, that we do need to start taking them into consideration, that many of our policies to try and reverse the biodiversity crisis involve a lot of habitat restoration and creation. You look at the new Scottish biodiversity strategy, for example, or the 25 year environment plan. And it's great. We really need that restoration. And I said, I'm not wanting to put people off doing that. All I'm wanting people to do is to start thinking about the biosecurity that should underpin that restoration and that habitat creation. Otherwise, we might have this risk of unintended consequences. I would also argue that we need to have a few things put in place. We do need greater awareness of the plant health risks to all habitats. 
and hopefully um, today we'll raise some of those uh, that awareness. I'd really like to see plant biosecurity included in all the sort of grants that go in for habitat creation and restoration work and in all the projects that go on. We need general increased awareness and people doing better risk assessments and biosecurity protocols. And we do need to think through how we actually monitor plant health in the natural environment and come up with a better reporting and identification process. So if you want further information, um, there's that web link again for that best practice guidance. Um, that's freely available for you to download. If you've got some Christmas money left over and you fancy spending it on a book, um, there's a book come out last year called Conservation Translocations um, that Martin Gaywood from Nature Scott edited. And I wrote a chapter in that on plant health, biosecurity, conservation translocations. If you can't get hold of anything or have further questions, do feel free to email me. And I'd just like to conclude by saying thank you all very much for listening and uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ruth. That's fantastic. I can see we're going to be all need to become as familiar for creating risk assessments for plant health as we are for um, health and safety risk assessments. And it certainly made me consider even for in-person field events, for member network events, how we can increase biosecurity procedures for members coming all across Scotland and the UK for attending those events. So very thought provoking um, and talk. Um, We've got a few questions and comments in the, in the chat, and I'll encourage everyone else just to add to the chat um, with any questions that they have. So a comment from Sean Hathaway on the, the section of the table that you had. So soil movement could also include wood chip, timber logs, collected leaves, et cetera. Um, certainly having worked on the New Zealand flatworm, it was very much timber chip that um, was a, a means of transportation. So yes, definitely on that one. Um, a question from Dave Cowley with uh, some comments from Rosalind Mystery as well. So in terms of heather moors, where grouse management artif artificially creates a uh, heather monoculture, isn't this a higher risk for both pathogens and climate change um, impact on the heather? And wouldn't more diversity be better for various reasons? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if you have yeah. any comments on that. I think it is. And I think generally there's some other work I didn't present, but I think habitats that are dominated by one species are going to be at far higher risk because, as you say, heather moorland is dominated by one species. And if the heather moorlands were more diverse um, and perhaps less artificially um, dominated by one species, then, yeah, definitely there would be less risk because you'd have more functional redundancy. You'd have other species around that could fill in the gaps and you might not potentially see that risk of large scale heather dieback. So, um, I wasn't necessarily meaning to suggest that um, heather-dominated moorlands completely were necessarily a good thing, but they're certainly at high risk, as you say, because they are just dominated by one species. Thank you, Ruth. And a comment from Andrew Wright from uh, based with Natural Resources Wales. The APHA in England and Wales are responsible for regulated pests in the wilder environment outside of woodlands, but not the non-regulated pests. Yeah. Um, so as you've as you're identifying sort of the reporting mechanisms need to be refined and reviewed um, so that if as professionals we are not 100 percent sure than members of the public, um, certainly this needs to be awareness raising. Um, any comments on that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is I think there are responsibilities in terms of once pests are identified. I think it's working out largely who you report it to when you're not. Um, aware of that that situation, not aware of whether whether it even is a pest or not, and it's getting that balance because obviously the authorities don't want to be inundated with plants that are perhaps dying off because we've had a bit of a drought year or something. But a lot of you are very, you know, obviously you're used to being outside, you're used to working in your different sites. You'll be aware when you see something that you think is unusual. And it's getting a mechanism whereby perhaps if we suddenly had a cluster of reports coming in say, oh, I'm seeing, you know, my vaccinium's looking a bit unhealthy this year at the moment, and oh, so is mine, and oh, so is mine, then that might start to flag an alert that perhaps we should go and start looking at the vaccinium, for example. 
um, you know, that situation occurred soon after we got the um, vaccinium rust in the commercial blueberry top crop. Mm. And we currently haven't got a mechanism for sort of putting that, getting that information together and flagging it and saying, well, perhaps we should go and sample some of that vaccinium and, and see whether it is something unusual or whether it's just natural dieback. Okay, thank you for that, Ray. Um, just to give everyone a moment to add any questions um, to that, I just noticed Andrew Wright, you've raised your hand. So if you'd like to come off mute, Andrew, and ask your question or comment, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, Ruth, very, very interesting. Thank you for that. I've got a question. We've been worried for, for a number of years about sort of spread of pests or diseases um, into habitats. Uh, and, and, and I work in the tree health side of things. So, so I, I think about Phytophthora morum uh, and other species like that. And there's been concerns for, for a number of years over that spread into vaccinium and in, into other habitats. And we've not seen that. I just wanted you to know if you had any views on, is that luck? Is it judgment? We, we, and and have, is there any experience of spread across into other habitats from known pests that were trying to be regulated or controlled? No, you're right. There was a lot of concern about the Phytophthora and we haven't seen that spread into the vaccinium yet, um, which is perhaps fortunate. Um, I think the examples in America with various Phytophthora species being spread out from um, nurseries during habitat restoration is a sort of learning lesson that, you know, it does happen, these risks are real. Um, I think the other one I'm very concerned about is Xylella. And I think it's Xylella, which is uh, this bacteria that's spread by spittle bugs. Um, I think if that got into the UK, that could start having a huge impact on our natural habitats because actually the spittle bugs that transmit the bacterium are very widespread in heather moorlands. Um, for example, it's not just in, in woodlands. I'm not sure that completely answers your question, but yeah. <laughs> no, it does. It does. Thank you very much. And, and I agree. Yes, Zayello is the... Yeah, if we, if we got it, if it did establish oh, the disaster that that could have. So thank you for that. Thank you very much, Andrew, for posing that question. Um, just while we're waiting for any more questions in the chat, just to say I will be sending out a feedback form tomorrow and um, a link to the recording from today's. So I know a few people are dropping it in and out signal wise. Um, and we can include a PDF of the presentation with the, the link as well, if you miss them. Um, so there's a question coming in from Emma Archer. Um, so when recommending plants to be included in planting, I've often suggested existing native species already in the area and those immediately neighbouring. Would you say this is a good approach rather than introducing species that may have been historically present or considered suitable? Um, if introducing, keeping things local as far as reasonably possible. Yes, I totally advocate keeping things local as far as reasonably possible, because um, then you're you're unlike you're less likely to introduce a pest or pathogen that's not already present in the area. So if you're particularly if you're starting to move things between different countries um, and import plants, that's a much higher risk because you don't know what you're importing. And it's really hard to check that mature plants um, are actually pest free. I saw there was a comment earlier about what did I mean by mature plants? And I'm largely thinking there about whole plants that you're importing that are moving around for restoration purposes. So not just sort of accidentally importing bits of mature plants on, on a vehicle or on equipment, which could be a risk. But the bigger risk is you know, moving um, whole plants, plus often a root bowl and all the soil that those plants around that root ball because it's really hard to know what you're transporting and you're really transporting a whole ecosystem um, and you don't know what's in it. Wonderful. Thank you, Ruth. Um, yeah, that's just Emma. Thank you for confirming. So if there are no other questions in the chat now, um, I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Ruth again for giving up her lunch hour. Um, to host this um, member network event for us. It's been fascinating as always. And as I say, I found it really thought provoking and need to go and reconsider some um, how to include biosecurity much more than we already do um, for a field visit. So 
I hope you found it useful and uh, thank you to all of you for joining this Science Scotland Member Network event as well. Thank you. Thank you.